थ्री टू वन वी आर लाइव नाउ गुड मॉर्निंग गोदा कैन आई कैन आई वेलकम एंड पे माई रिगार्ड टू डॉक्टर वासु हेलो डॉक्टर वासु हाउ आर यू ग्रेट It's it's great to see you. Good morning. Good morning. After seeing you many after many many years. Yeah. Uh, Your video is not on. My video is not on. Oh yeah, just a moment. Let's see if it is working now. Anyways, there must be something. But uh, before Goda takes over, I um, I thank you. And as a ritual, this the uh, fellow fellow module we have been running for two years. and uh, uh, this is a deformity and uh, limb deficiency module and i was fortunate to have goda with uh, me and you have trained her so much that i i learned a lot of things from her so i gave uh, this uh, responsibility to her to arrange this module and uh, we are so fortunate that the first uh, lecture is from you so a warm welcome and uh, thanks to accepting our invitation please goda you can take over now goda yes. has been behind me <laughs> <laughs> thank you sir thank you for accepting the invitation so, uh, i'll just introduce sir in a brief ne padichu alle nenu kanna nenu kuda ne kada no inta raithe as we all know vasudevan sir does not require any introduction but for a formal introductory session he mm. has done his mbbs from calicut medical college and ms ortho from kilcock medical college chennai sir initially worked and was the founder of ardi institute of research in elizara and currently sir is the head of the department and is working in tangam institute of orthopedic super specialty at palakkad sir is the president uh, of orthopedic association of south indian states and he was the past president of ko and is an active member in assam he has received various medals as well as the prestigious professor kv sundaran memorial gold medal in for best paper in kottayam he was invited as a guest lecture lecturer or uh, to give guest lectures in various international conferences like few in bristol istanbul barcelona and malaysia so has given various orations like silver jubilee oration at kottayam presidential oration in oss 2015 ki george memorial oration and professor p l alexander memorial oration he has presented more than 150 papers in state national and international conferences has been faculty for more than 150 national and international conferences and he has various publications in jbgs and other national and international journals he is very famous for his pipe and fixation technique he actually standardized it with which we can treat most of the distal radial fractures he is the course director of palakkad deformity course he has trained many uh, fellows all across the country and i was fortunate enough to learn elizaro and the basics of orthopedics and everything in from him thank you so much sir for accepting uh, to take up this webinar thank you thank you goda for the nice words thank you so can we start now yes sir is it yes sir it's visible sir yes sir and audible yes sir audible and visible so at the outset let me thank uh, my close friend uh, maureen who made me to this talk and instructing goda to pull me into the trap anyway you know taking uh, classes is a very uh, enjoying moment for me teaching students i always like and maureen has been doing this program for i think uh, post corona maybe corona has done good thing for us one of the few things which has done good for us so let us enjoy it and improve our knowledge now the topic today is uh, how to evaluate a deformed lower limb and i'm mainly concentrating on the frontal plane 
I will show you some uh, images, some cases, and planning uh, maybe two scenarios in the tibia and one scenario in the femur. Further details is difficult to go. And multi-angular, uh, multi-level correction, I am not I mean, uni uniapical, multi-apical, I am not touching into it. You know, the causes of deformities, it can be many things like post-traumatic, like a trauma-related, or it may be due to treatment-related, which is unavoidable many times. Sometimes treatment fails. And you can have congenital deformities, post-infectious, developmental problems, tumor-related, idiopathic, and so on. The problem, the deformity may be due to soft tissue or it may be due to bone. So we will concentrate mainly on the bony deformity. The bony deformities are in many planes, like in a vertical axial plane, that limb length disparity. Limb length disparity, many people don't, they may not consider as a deformity, but to me it's a deformity in the axial plane. And rotations, <clears throat> rotation, to me, rotation is, that includes even angulation. I'll, I'll show that image later. And you can have translations in any planes. You can have a strange combination of all three together. So the area is very, very, I um, mean, big, which is unimaginable. Many times it may be very unimaginable. So to me, the angulations and rotations are all angulations. The angulation is a rotation around a horizontal axis, like a medial lateral axis, you call it as, when it is rotated in this plane, you call it a procurvatum or recurvatum. So this is a mere angulation. Whereas when you look at it from the AP view, when you have a various deformity or valgus deformity, it's again a rotation or angulation around an andro-posterior axis. So this is again an angulation. And you know, when you call rotation, rotation itself is an angulation. But the only thing is, there the axis is in the long vertical axis, and it rotates around that. That is how you say, so this much, 30 degrees of rotation, external rotation, or 30 degrees of internal rotation, you say like, it's again an angulation. The, the main point of all these things are, all these things are angulations. The rotations, angulation, virus, valgus, procrobatum, everything is an angulation. The advantage of this is, you can connect all these things together into oblique different planes. Like, instead of like frontal plane, uh, sagittal plane, you can have oblique plane and you can have further uh, complex planes in three dimension situations in so many different ways you can have it. So, by looking into it, we must differentiate whether our deformity is a static one or a progressive one. If it is a static deformity, we have to evaluate to find out the problems, why it has happened, where it is there, and how much, and then find out the solutions. If it is a progressive one, that is, it is going to change in future time, then we must modify our uh, line of management. And either we make it static by epiphysio disease or such sort of things, so fuse it, Though it becomes static, then you correct whatever there remains whole life. Or you can even think about somebody controlling it like epilepsy disease or epilepsy growth modulations and then The problems of deformities are many people, they don't like it. There is one reason, cosmetic. I don't like this deformity, I want to get corrected. I have no other issues. 
some people will say it is painful that you have already advanced it so it is painful i am not bothered about deformity but i would like to get get rid of the pain and some people will say so i am not very happy moving around it's not very stable so you correct the instability there so deformity can be in all planes and uh, you know all the deformities an alteration in the mechanical axis leads on to in a mechanical axis deviation an alteration in the joint alignment leads to mal alignment and alteration in the joint orientation leads to mal orientation so these are the issues like mechanical axis deviation mal alignment and mal orientation and you know alignment is an important consideration uh, not only for deformity correction but very important for arthroplasty and uh, fracture management and it's very important that we don't create a new deformity while correcting another deformity or a fracture so we have to be very care we knowledgeable about the uh, deformity planning and axis considerations which is we are lacking in our uh, postgraduate curriculum no one teaches about these things so i'll show you just a simple example of a mcmurray osteotomy a 40 years of follow up for a young girl which was done at 13 years and the result after 40 years So she had a, a non-union of the neck of femur, which was managed by McMurray osteotomy then. And at the age of 35, she had developed lateral knee pain, and no one bothered about it. This was the X-ray at the at, at the at the age of 35. So she had the injury. I mean, she had the surgery at 13 years, and no one was bothered about it. i saw her when she was about 53 years 53 years you can see it is completely damaged so how this has happened this has happened only because mcmurray osteotomy and shortening because your epiphysis has gone so she has never been bothered about limb length disparity correction she has never been bothered about the mal alignment so the limb length disparity and mal alignment has drifted her mechanical axis laterally and has produced over stress on the lateral compartment and this was the end result at 53 years and she underwent a knee replacement for this you know what is going to happen for her for some reason my slides are not moving anyway so this is a, another unfortunate young man who came to me with uh, with this condition Just perfectly aligned knee joint. See his X-ray. His only issue was a genu valgus. So genu valgus, uh, it was due to the distal femur, and it was unfortunately corrected on the proximal tibia. Now his knee joint has become oblique. The limb looks straight, and an acute correction of valgus into virus resulted into a foot drop. So he got a discount of foot drop, and this was the condition. Now he has a foot drop plus a subluxating knee because his femur was subluxating medially when a when he is trying to have a stance phase. So on the tibia, the femur slides. So you need to have correction of the iatrogenic deformity here and distal femur original deformity. So this is what I am I am mentioning. Don't create a new deformity while correcting another one. this is another case of a tibial deformity so the limb looks perfectly straight even better than the opposite side but see the knee joint x ray so here the old dictum any valgus is corrected in the femur and all virus are corrected in the tibia he had a tibial valgus so based on the dictum 
he underwent a correction on the femur. I mean, on the femur, yeah, all valgus in the femur. And as a net result, his knee joint is completely damaged. So this is again another complicated case. He had a fracture shaft of femur at a very young age, which got myelinated into virus. So clinically, he was looking like he had a genuvirum. Again, the surgeon uh, corrected his uh, genuvirum. As per the basic rule, no, all the virus are corrected in the TB. So some surgeon corrected the that virus into the on the tibia. But the interesting part is this was the X-ray. So the femur was looking virus, but your mechanical axis and joint orientation line was looking perfect. So what happened was that is the nature's the, the children's uh, compensations. They the child he has developed during child has developed the nature has corrected is shaft virus by two metaphysical corrections. And that is why his femur, though looks bad, but your axis planning, everything was perfect. The, the, uh, the, the, the coxa, there is no coxa virus and the LDFA is normal. So the iatrogenic deformity got revealed now. The, the, the tibial val HTO, which was made into valgus, got revealed by the nature's correction of the femur. So this was his clinical condition. And he was advised total knee replacement. And this is how I corrected it. I corrected his mild limb length disparity plus lengthening. You can see it is completely realigned. Only tibial, tibial deformity correction. So the, all the issues are, we must get a good x-ray. And that is not enough. Understand our X-ray well, because we are only as good as our X-rays. If you don't get a good X-ray, nothing is going to work out. You can look at this guy. I generally use it in most of the cases because it has a lot of uh, teaching uh, points. And maybe I, I, I'm proudly saying that this case has taught me my main uh, lessons in deformity planning. This happened long back, maybe 95. So this girl was referred to me with a very complex deformity of the hip, knee, and the ankle with the 180 degrees of rotation, external rotation. That's what he mentioned. See, remember our technicians are trained to take X-rays of normal people in anatomical positions. When anatomy is distorted, the technicians are confused. They cannot take a good X-ray. You know, the X-rays are for us. So it has to judge whatever our clinical judgment, clinical decisions, clinical diagnosis. That has to be substantiated by getting a good X-ray. So the what the, in a complicated case like this, we have to go to the X-ray room and we must get the X-ray which we want. So that the technician may not know. So you must go to the X-ray room and help him. So this was the X-ray which I got. The technician took an X-ray like this. That was the AP view. You can see the femur lateral view there. And you can see even the fibula on the medial side. <clears throat> so remember our eyes will see what our mind knows. We will only correct what we see. So we must see it properly and correct it. So in most deformities, there's a primary deformity, which is a real deformity, and secondary deformity, which is compensatory deformities. In some cases, it is only like correctable. Some people, it may be like a compensatory deformity in the bones. And mostly these deformities are adopted by the patient for comfortable walking. Now, how to sort it out, the primary and secondary? The only way is a clinical, detailed clinical examination is the only key. Which nowadays, you know, the clinical examination is gradually coming down. 
we started treating mostly the investigations like MRI, CTs and other things. So you cannot even, in such a complicated cases, you cannot substitute clinical exam. Straightforward case is okay, but we must have a good clinical examination skill to locate all the identifiable, identifiable anatomical landmarks and try to place it well in the anatomical positions and take an appropriate x-ray. You can see that That's how I'm examining, finding out the knee range of movements. And my index is feeling the patella, keeping the patella pointing to the roof. Now that is the knee range of movement, plane of knee movements, and hip adduction, abduction, and keeping it in the anatomical positions. Now you can see that her ankle is at the shoulder. And this was how she was compensating. It was just looking compensation, I mean, complex only because of compensation. So this is her uh, flexion and this is her extension of the knee. And, and the x-ray in that position is this. So the complicated x-ray which is looking like this has been converted into an x-ray like this. Now anyone can make a diagnosis, anyone can correct it, anyone can plan it. Now that is, this is the real, you can see the perfect AP view. You can see the perfect AP view of the knee joint with a patella around that area. Now, this is anatomical axis plan because you cannot make this patient stand and take in a full-length X-ray, which is not possible. So, we are planning based on the anatomical axis. That is why we have to be very familiar with uh, both mechanical and an anatomical axis planning. That is the proximal anatomical axis, distal anatomical axis. <clears throat> they are not meeting anywhere. And you cannot, you have to then make a, that green line, which is the intermediate line. And you can get 105 degrees of distal femur valgus and 65 degrees, totaling about 170 degrees of distal femur valgus. So the beauty of Illusorol is you can, once you identify your problem, once you plan it properly, now you can make a frame which is matching the patient's deformities. So create a frame which can match your issues and fix it to the patient. Do an appropriate osteotomy. There are many other problems like you have to do osteotomy from the medial side, but that all possible you can do that. Think about all the neurovascular structures, femoral artery and all. So you can do one osteotomy at that level, another osteotomy here with a complex frame you can see it is gradually coming out. A little more it is coming out. It is almost coming to normal. It will come back to normal post. So from, this is the final healing. It took about nearly 11 months. So from here to here, it's only like a detailed clinical examination and proper planning and an idea about the alignment and malalignment. There's nothing big in it. Anyone can do the correction. The only people think strange. It's a strange deformity. But actually, it is not strange. If you know it, it is not at all strange. Now, how do you assess the frontal plane deformities? Or any deformity? We have malalignment test, which is designed by Joel Pile. So, by it's a standardization of the evaluation of the frontal deformities. How do you check the alignment? There is no big thing in it. It's all about drawing lines and measuring angles on a well-taken X-ray. The important thing is you must know how to draw these lines. You must know how to draw these angles. That I think uh, uh, you our, during our lower primary or UP school level, we must have seen all these geometries. It's easy to do it. And taking a good X-ray in the anatomical position. This is the only thing which you need. So one basic question is, how do you draw a line? There are two options of drawing a line. If you have two specific points, you connect these two together, then you'll get a specific line. Like when you draw a mid-diaphasal line or anatomical axis, you need two mid-diaphasal points 
connect these two points together you get an anatomical axis when you are doing an anatomical a mechanical axis of the femur you need a, a a center of the femoral head and center of the knee joint two points on these point these levels and connect the line between these two you get a mechanical axis of the femur what is the next option of drawing a line so if you have a reference line like a distal femur condylar line distal I mean the lower femoral reference wire I mean line a joint orientation line and you have a point like the center of the knee joint and you have an angle like an 87 degrees lateral or 81 degrees lateral 87 degrees lateral from the midpoint of the femoral condylar line to draw a line, a line that will be the distal mechani mechanical axis to draw a line at 81 degrees it will be an anatomical axis line so these are the two important points you must know how to draw about a line in the axis planning which is very very basic this is one way when with the angle you draw the next line so anatomical and mechanical axis joint alignment the joint alignment is the alignment of the centers of the knee joint hip joint and the angle joint usually they are collinear they are in the single line so that's called is collinear joint orientation means the relationship of any joint line to the mechanical axis in what angle the joint line is in which angle to the mechanical axis you know the normal values and how it is different so the anatomical axis if you have two points you connect these two point mid diaphyseal points you connect with a straight line that's called mid diaphyseal line which is anatomical axis whether it is femur or tibia anywhere the mid diaphyseal line is going to be the anatomical axis mechanical axis means a line connecting the center point of the ends of the segment like when you say mechanical axis of the lower limb that means a line connecting the femoral head to the center of the angle joint it comes one line connecting all together that's mechanical axis of the limb when you say the mechanical axis of the femur from the center of the femoral head to the center of the knee joint in on the femur it becomes mechanical axis of the femur similarly on the tibia center of the knee joint to the center of the angle it becomes mechanical axis of the tibia <clears throat> now from where where will you write, I mean draw all these lines you must get a good x ray how to take a good x ray for standardization of lower limb for frontal plane deformities a long standing radiographs of ap view for sagittal plane you take a lateral so it must expose hip knee and angle in one sure shot either you can have a one long film which i have a long film earlier i used to have three films stacked together i will show that stacking later nowadays you don't need that and keep the tube at the at a distance of about 10 feet at the distance of about 10 feet because there the magnification is minimum and you will get one shot cover centering the knee joint with the patella pointing forward with an additional magnification marker usually the magnification will be around 4 to 5 percent at the distance of 10 feet but it is always better that you train your radiographer to keep a magnification marker so that your precise measurement is possible in many of the recent uh, software it automatically measures the uh, the real length of the bone in many of the softwares so this is how we take the three stacking images and correct the limb length disparity on a block see that the pelvis is square and take a shoot centering the knee joint centering the patella forward and it's always it's an important point that don't take x ray like this and correct the limb length disparity on a block and then take the x ray knee forward and it's never foot forward if you keep the foot forward sometimes the patella may be off so see that look at the knee joint keep the knee forward if you want any specific x rays of the knee ankle or hip you can take another specific x ray ankle with leg or knee with leg or knee with femur specific x ray can be taken depending on the cases with the patella pointing forward 
centered on the femoral condyle and being perpendicular to flexion extension axis of the knee. But sometimes you may have a subluxated patella or displacement of the lateral femoral condyle. So that's an exception. Sometimes you may have to be careful in such cases. So coming to the uh, introduction of uh, mechanical axial lower limb, it is a line from the center of the femoral head to the center of the ankle platform. Normally, it goes to the center of the knee joint. That means hip, knee and ankle are collinear. Usually, it is in the center or just medial to it. Whereas, on the other side, you can see the mechanical axis has moved more medial. So, what do you call this? This is called medial mechanical axis deviation. So, how do you measure the mechanical axis deviation? It is measured at the real distance, not the x-ray distance, the real distance, the perpendicular real distance from the mechanical axis to the center of the knee joint. Normally, you can have about 0 to 16 millimeters. Remember, it is not from the x-ray because nowadays, you get a miniature x-rays and the miniature x-ray is actually very minimum. You must have the magnification marker like this. Using the magnification marker, you resolve the find out the distance, how much is the mechanical axis deviation. In the tibia, the mechanical axis and anatomical axis are practically the same. Whereas in the femur, the mechanical axis and anatomical axis are different. So that is the mechanical axis and that is the anatomical axis. They are not same in the femur. So that is why the femur is a bent bone. So mechanical axis is different, anatomical axis are different. They are subtending an angle of about 6 to 7 degrees. So this is very, very important in the femur. Because if you are planning for any nailing, correction or deformity by nail, you always go by the anatomic axis plan. When you plan for Elidoro, you always plan for mechanical axis plan because your frame has to be 90 degrees to the mechanical axis. Because the load comes on that straight axis, the frame should counter it properly. Now, how to draw the joint orientation lines for the ankle? So, you mark two points along the tibial platforms and connect it. So that is the ankle orientation line, distal, tib distal tibial uh, frontal plane angle joint line. This is a tibial knee joint line, which is the mid tib medial and mid point on mid lateral point. You connect them together of the condyle, mid point on the medial and lateral condyle and connect them together. And for the distal femur, the femoral condylar line, that's called femoral knee joint orientation line, the maximum convex point on the lateral femoral condyle and medial femoral condyle and connect the line connecting these two. That is called the uh, femoral knee joint orientation line. Coming to hip, the very, very difficult to draw a line because the head is round, globular, difficult to draw a line. And depending on the rotations, it can mimic in many, like the Valga virus, it can mimic based on the rotation because you say peculiar neck shaft angle there. So you can have issues. So what by consider is like we have conventionally designed like the tip of the GT and center of the femoral head. You connect a line these two. So that is considered as the hip joint orientation line. So this is the normal alignment and mechanical axis. Normal alignment of mechanical axis and normal joint orientation lines. Joint line, femoral condyle line, proximal tibial line, distal tibial line, on all the axis. Remember, almost all these lines are nearly 90 degrees. 90 degree LPFA, LDFA is about 88, 90 degrees, 85 to 90 degrees. MPTA is about 87 degrees and LDTA is about 89. So all these are almost 90 degrees. So just remember that roughly about that much. So how to do a 
good malalignment test. Get an X-ray like this, and left side is abnormal, right side is normal. Draw the mechanical axis of the limb. That is on the right side. It is perfectly normal. Go in the collinear joint. On the other side, you can see it is medial mechanical axis deviation. You have the normal values given on the other side. And now you draw the mechanical axis of the femur. So what is this one means? This mechanical axis deviation means there is some deformity somewhere. A genu virus. There it is a deformed, maybe deformity, maybe in the knee joint, it may be in the tibia, it may be in the femur. Just says us there is a deformity. Now you draw a mechanical axis of the femur and take draw the distal femur uh, femoral condylar line, measure that LDFA lateral mechanic mechanical LDFA, and do the same thing on the opposite side. See, both of these are 87 degrees. So that means, which is the normal limit, we can see it is 87 degrees. So this is normal. So that means this patient's medial mechanical axis deviation is not contributed by the femur. The femur is normal. Then we have to go to draw the mechanical axis of the tibia on the right side, on the left side. Tibial condylar line, tibial plateau line, tibial plateau line, measure MPTA on the left side, measure MPTA on the right side. So on the right side, it's 87 degrees, which is within the normal range. So the femur uh, right side is normal, whereas left side is 73 degrees. So that shows this patient has a mechanical axis deviation due to the tibial cause. Now we have to find out where exactly in the tibia, that will come to it later. Now you must confirm that your uh, mechanic, your ankle is normal. Draw the angle profound line and hip joint orientation line. See that your uh, LDTA is normal and LPFA is normal. So once, you are, once all other parameters are normal, only your MPTA is altered. So that means it's a pure tibial deformity. So the cause of mechanic, medial mechanical axis deviation is tibial, virus of about 14 degrees, 70, 87 minus 73, which is about 14 degrees. So this is another case, a similar case of a mechanical axis deviation. Here you can see that the femur is up, LDFA is abnormal, which is more than 90 degrees. And the MPT is also abnormal. So some cases you can have a medial mechanical axis deviation, which can be due to both femur and tibial causes. In some other cases, you can have your LDFA normal, MPTA normal, and this may be purely due to a knee joint cause, such as a ligamentous laxity. And sometimes you can have a tibial condyle. You can see the lateral condyle is parallel, medial condyle is oblique, like pagoda tibia. So this is an intra-articular cause of the tibial medial plateau depression. So this can be due to a femoral condyle depression. So all these causes genuvirum. So there are so many different causes of genuvirum. You cannot consider like all genuvirums are same. So locate exactly what is your problem and correct it. And to complete the malignment test, we must measure the joint length convergence angle and check for subluxation in the midpoint of the femur and tibia and check femoral condylar line, tibial plateau line for any depression, angle profound line and measure LDT is normal and check the hip orientation. This completes the malalignment test. <coughs> Goda, is there any, any doubt? Anyone has any doubt on this? Uh, sir, there is one doubt, sir. How much of joint malorientation can be accepted? Joint malorientation? Yes, sir. How much of joint malorientation can be expected is one question. Yeah, that's a normal value, sir, is about 2 to, I told you, you know, that 2 to, uh, that measurement is there, you can even 
check it find out yeah zero zero to two jlc join line convergence yes. angle zero to two degrees yeah this question was about uh, we we see some patients uh, where we see their uh, their joint uh, orientation is more than this 3 degrees yeah but is there any uh, literature that uh, this amount of mal orientation leads to osteoarthritis in future because if there is 5 degree of mal orientation we we won't go for its correction that that was my question uh, yeah the main problem is the design of the human body we are all bipedal and our leg is connected to the side just imagine a person of 80 kilos weight trying to stand on a leg on one side no carpenter can make such a decision but such a design so here even normal alignment you have got nearly 70% load going on to the medial condyle of the tibia yeah so that depends on the patient the stock weight and the quality of the articular cartilage and many other things are there so if it is more on to the medial side then the loading will be more than 90 degrees 90% right all depends upon many other clinical parameters are there if the patient's condition body weight and you know the hip abductor power tensor fascial at a power because you know the tensor fascial at is a muscle which originates yeah. from the iliac crest and directly going to the tibia yep if you tighten that one you are actually shifting the mechanical axis laterally mm mm-hmm. but unfortunately now we have lost the skill of using that mm mm-hmm. So you know that during our uh, UG studies, I was always wondering why this muscle, what this muscle is doing. It is bypassing whole hip and knee joint. Yeah, and going to the tibia from the iliac crest. So right. that is you know, in some people it may not create any trouble, but find out both ways. I usually do everything. So you cannot do the mal alignment. That means the joint line convergence correction is very very. Yeah. It's difficult. Where to correct it? It can be due to the femur. You have to either make a femoral correction or the tibia. So this this phenomenon happens. You know, we see sometimes uh, near skeletal maturity children where uh, the deformity is arising from femur. Yeah. And uh, for that deformity to get completely corrected just by growth modulation. Mm-hmm. we have less time and so we have seen that sometimes uh, people cheat and do the tibial as well as femoral growth modulation yes yeah. and the mechanical axis gets aligned but we now see that there is a, a deformity in the proximal tibial yeah so uh, mo- most of us are doing pediatric orthopedic practice so we the patients gets transitions to adult deformity surgeons so when you take a decision that this joint orientation is not right do you, do you want them to become symptomatic and then you do osteotomy or that's what my question is how much of try to, try to get into the normal position possible it may not be always possible yeah but correction is usually just by by clinical uh, clinical uh, right oh. because especially you know the alignment calculation in children if a condyle knee joint line measurement may not be perfect that's right even when you do the epiphyseal like growth plate measurement you can still have a deformity between the joint and the epiphysis you can sometimes have a longer medial medial condyle than lateral you can have a mild lateral condyle dysplasia yeah. that will not be seen by in many of the children that, that's right because so, unless we do an arthrogram you know the uh, ossified epiphysis may not be representing the center of the femur right. many times yeah I so think Gunda, there is one. Area. In the children, it's a gray area. Yeah. Sir, so, there's one more question. I think. Yes, yeah, so sir. One question, uh, sir. Did you release the common peroneal nerve in that deformed knee girl case? This is from Dr. Raman Shrivastava. I wanted to do it, but the problem there was I could not even put my finger there, no. So I didn't even do. I didn't even touch the peroneal nerve. Yes. Sir. so my right limiting step in that case is peroneal nerve when you do the distraction you are don't correct it on the tib- on the bone correct it on the nerve 
What yes. I want is I want one millimeter lengthening on the peroneal nerve. This, in fact, it's a case of peroneal nerve lengthening. Yes. Yeah. So if yes. I correct on the femur, the peroneal nerve will go. It's, it's a gradual correction, and you don't need to release it, right? That's what you want to say. Yeah. yeah. But if we, if we do, always we are on the lookout. If the, if she develops a, a long-standing case, when you correct it, you can have a peroneal nerve issue. In that particular case, more than 50%, I was expecting it. Luckily, I didn't have any issues. But I'm ready to do a release after it is coming out. Right. right. So that, that's an eye-opening case and uh, very impressive that a thorough understanding can give you great result. Yeah. Yeah. We can go ahead, sir, now. Yeah. Gota, how much time is left? Sir, around... Uh, 15 minutes plus 10 minutes would be there, sir. Yeah, we can stop at any moment. Yeah. The most important part is understanding and discussion. Yes, sir. So it is not the completion of the talk. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So now, Okay, here you can see the MPTA is about 72 degrees and MLDFA is normal and tibial plateau line and all other joint orientation lines are okay, but only tibia is the real cause. You can, everyone can see that it's a tibial diaphysia deformity. Now, how to go about it? You draw the proximal mechanical axis of the tibia. Here, being LDFA normal and your mechanical axis of the femur and LDFA is normal and tibial plat knee joint orientation is also okay, you can just extend that line downwards as the proximal tibial mechanical axis. Then we can draw a line, the distal uh, mechanical axis, a mid FSA line, angle orientation line, Check that LDTA is about 89, 90, 91 degrees. And the point where the proximal and distal mechanical axis are meeting is known as the cora, center of rotational axis. So that is known as the cora. And that is the bisector line. And this angle is the magnitude of the deformed. So this is the magnitude of the deformed. Now, how do you correct it? If you are doing by Elizoro, you just need two ring block on the top, two ring block below the osteotomy. And the corticotomy at or near the bisector line with a olive wire. If you are using all wire, use olive wires based on the rule of thumb. Like if you are trying to correct it with my finger, you will correct it like this. So you need one olive here another olive on the convex side closer to the osteotomy and on the concave side away from the osteotomy. So these olive wires and the osteotomy make a frame and get a plan for a perfect open hinge corrected like this. So that red, that blue spots are the olive wires based on the rule of thumb. So once again, a point making the same point, that is the mechanical axis of the lower limb. Measure mechanical axis deviation. Draw the mechanical axis line of the femur. Femoral joint orientation line. Measure M mechanical LDFA. M LDFA because you, I told you, you know, there are two lines from the femur mechanical and anatomical axis. They are all different. So when you calculate LDFA based on the mechanical axis, you name it as M LDFA, which just denotes this is a mechanical LDFA which is about 87 degrees. When you're planning an anatomic axis planning, then this will be 81 degrees. That has to be mentioned like ALDFA, that is anatomical LDFA. And MLDFA is about 87 degrees, which is inside the normal range. That is a tibial mechanical axis. The MPTA is about 72 degrees, which is abnormal. Then you extend the femoral condylar line downwards, draw the distal tibial uh, mechanical axis, Draw the angle joint line, confirm LDTA is normal, and that is the cora, that is the magnitude of the deformity. 
and that is a transverse bisector line and you know that is the cora I mean the hinge akka akka means the angulation correction axis or axis of correcting angulation and 30 degree you correct it so this is osteotomy rule 1 osteotomy rule 1 is your uh, osteotomy the knee joint and angle orientation lines are sort of normal so you have mpta joint orientation lines are normal so what is osteotomy rule 1 osteotomy uh, rule 1 is osteotomy at cora osteotomy at cora and hinge and akka akka is again hinge only now this is the actual correcting axis angulation correcting axis so that is a hinge which is on the bisector line on the bisector line and the correction restores the mechanical axis proximal and distal mechanical axis are now aligned and it restores the joint orientation both of a tibial plateau knee joint and angle joint orientations are all aligned so osteotomy at the cora along the bisector line akka at cora or along the bisector line you correct the magnitude of the deformity it restores both mechanical axis anatomical axis and joint orientations that is osteotomy rule 1 so that is the transverse bisector line this is a proximal mechanical axis distal axis the angle alpha is the magnitude angle beta is the obtuse angle this is an acute angle this is obtuse angle so this is this bisector line is the line which cuts the obtuse angle the angle beta the beta angle divided into two that is called a transverse bisector line so the coras can lie anywhere along the transverse line this is not a one cora the cora can be along the bisector line anywhere so if you keep the cora at the convex border here then you are going to get an opening hinge so that is a convex border you get opening hinge when you keep the cora at the center you get a neutral you have to just remove a very minimal part of the convex spine the this is how you do the nailing when you do nailing the there will be a neutral hinge so when you keep the cora on the convex side concave side so that you have to remove a wedge out this is how you do for a plating you take the wedge out so there the cora is on the closing so that means all these things are along the transverse bisector line so it can be an opening hinge neutral hinge and a closing hinge so the corticotomy should be at cora or very near to the cora <coughs> and akka is always on the bisector line so that have you have the choice you can keep it anywhere so if you are using on the concave border you get a closing hinge and you can fix with a plate so using in the center that's called a neutral hinge you can do for nailing when you keep it in the open hinge it's an opening uh, the convex border you get open hinge that you have to resort only by elizoro or plating with the bone graft and when you keep it on the convex side that the lengthening by distraction hinge that you need any elizoro so cora and transverse bisector line so this you can see an elizoro with a cora on the convex border you correct it it completely realigns and joint orientation lines are also well maintained now if you shift the core akka little more to the convex side along the bisector line so what you will get you get a lengthening hinge so this is called distraction hinge this is again osteotomy rule 1 now i'll show you a different situation you do an osteotomy at a level a little bit different than your your uh, transverse bisector line or the cora maybe you have a scar there not a very good area you have a sclerotic bone so not very ideal to do an osteotomy at the cora for practical reason we have shifted the mechanical axis a little bit up 
And if you try to correct it with the aka at the kora, you are going to get a minimal translation at that area. This, this translation is directly proportional to the distance from the kora. The more you, more higher you go, the, the bigger the translation. So try to keep it as close to the kora as possible. So this is known as osteotomy rule two. Here again, it corrects the alignment and it corrects the uh, orientation. You can see everything is getting corrected there. But the only thing is a minimal anatomical axis. Uh, an anatomical axis is not perfectly correct. So this will be the final result. MPTA normal, LDTA normal. And here osteotomy rule 2. The osteotomy is not done exactly at the cora, a little bit away. But you keep the hinge at the cora on the bisector line. On correction, bone ends will angulate and translate. And the mechanical axis will be completely realigned. Maybe something like a focal dome osteotomy is almost again an osteotomy rule too. And the only thing is the anatomical axis is a little bit distorted, which has no significance. And especially in children, in further growth, they will remodel back to the normal position in such cases. That is most of the cases like Brown's disease and all, you do osteotomy rule too. In many of the practical cases, we do osteotomy rule to juxta articular deformities. We resort to osteotomy rule too, but keep the uh, aka at the exact, uh, exact point. So the remodeling will take place, reshaping will be done by the body. This is another situation. We do an osteotomy at a different level than cora. You don't bother to keep the aka at the cora. You keep the aka at a different level. So that means you plan something. You have drawn the, uh, you have done the magnitude, you got the transverse bisectal and everything. But at the time of osteotomy, you did the osteotomy at a different level. You have kept the aka at a different level. So what will happen now? It gets corrected. The proximal and tibial distal mechanical axis are not well collected. They are only parallel. So after correcting 30 degree, they are not parallel. So this is known as osteotomy rule 3. Your MPT is not normal. Your LDT is not normal. Then you correct it completely. So osteotomy rule 3 means osteotomy and ACA are not at the cora. ACA and osteotomy not on the bisector line. On correction, bone end will angulate and translate. So both mechanical and anatomical axis are distorted. This is mentioned not to be done. So many people may do like this, but this has to be avoided. But you know, in children, they have a lot of growth potency. So they will even correct this. So in children, you can take a little more, uh, more extra advantage. In, in adults, you should not do an osteotomy rule three. Any, any questions on that, Goda? No, sir. As of now, no questions. Oh, I hope everyone is clear. Osteotomy yes. rule one, two, and three. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, now sir. I think I'll, if time permits, I can go for the proximal tibial deformity. I think, yes, we can go for 10 more minutes. Yeah. Buddha. Yes, sir. 10 yeah. minutes. Yeah. yeah. So now this is a, again a mechanical axis deviation like earlier case. So your MLDF is 87 degrees. MPTA is same magnitude like 88, 74 degrees. So you obviously that is abnormal. Now here again, as earlier cases, we can extend the proximal mechanical axis downward. And you can draw the distal mechanical anatomical mechanical axis and draw the angle joint line. LDT is 89 degrees. And that is a cora. And that is a magnitude of about 12 degrees. So here is an example where, so that is the malorient MPTA and LDTA. On the right side is the anatomical axis planning. Both are practically the same. So that is the, how will you correct here? Can you do an osteotomy at the cora? 
So this is the bisector line. Can you do an osteotomy on the bisector line? So these are the situations mostly we see in children, Brown's disease and many other uh, conditions, even in HDOs. So here is a situation where you have to use osteotomy rule 2. You can do a dome osteotomy like this or do a metavisual osteotomy and correct it like this. So a juxtaarticular deformity, cora is too close to the knee joint to do a corticotomy. So the hinge at the cora and corticotomy at a different level, it may be a little bit lower level. And we are going to get a translatory correction, but that regains the mechanical axis well. You can even do a think about a dome osteotomy, which is a smiling dome osteotomy. So osteotomy rule two is not at osteotomy is not at cora, hinge on bisector line. On correction, both ends will bone ends will angulate and translate. The mechanical axis will be completely realigned. The only thing is anatomical axis is a little bit distorted. So this is an example where I, I kept it a ring fixators. You can see a conical bar on top. So the axis is at the, the rotate, the aca is at the upper level of the ring. And this is the deformity. That is how it has been corrected. And that is the end result before and after. So this is a, just going through the femur deformity planning. That is the mechanical, minimal mechanical axis deviation medially. So you draw the mechanical axis of the tibia, femur, and MLD if is about 96 degree, which is abnormal. Even on the opposite side, it is abnormal. So you cannot use the opposite side value for this measurement. Even tibia is abnormal, 94 degrees. The opposite side tibia is 87, which is normal. So these are all abnormal sites. Now, how to draw the distal mechanical axis of the femur? The opposite side is abnormal. So you have to take a population average, like 87 degree lateral, you draw the mechanical axis of the distal femur. Now, how to draw the proximal femur mechanical axis? The proximal femur mechanical axis is drawn based on the anatomical axis of the femur using a three-line technique. So that means in the earlier slide, I have shown you a situation where the relationship of the anatomical and mechanical axis has been given. It's about seven degrees angle there. So, so that relationship can be used to draw a mechanical axis of the femur based on the anatomical axis. So this is the three-line technique. So you draw the mechanical axis and based on this, you draw similar line and I will show you that again. So that is the mechanical axis. This is the anatomical axis. So these are subtending an angle of about seven degrees. Now, you draw a line which is just parallel to the anatomical axis through the center of the femoral head. So now you have two parallel lines. So these are two parallel lines of the anatomical axis. Now you know the normal relationship of between these two about seven degrees. So based on the properties of a parallel lines, when two parallel lines are crossed by another straight line, these opposite angles are all same. So that means if you want a line, which is this mechanical axis, you take about seven degrees lateral from the femoral head, you draw this line. So initially you have this line, anatomical axis. So similarly, you have the anatomical axis. You draw a line parallel to that anatomical axis to the center of the femoral head. Draw a line at seven degrees from the center of the femoral head. So this red line, will become the proximal mechanical axis. Now you have a distal mechanical axis and proximal mechanical axis. They are meeting at that point. So this is the cora and that is the magnitude. And measure the LPFA, which is normal, and that is the cora and that is the magnitude. That is based on anatomical axis calculation. You, the, distal the distal angle must be 
81 degrees, a mid-diaphyseal point there, mid-diaphyseal point, rho hip joint orientation line, femoral condylar line, the anatomical LDFA must be about 81 degrees, this will be about 90 degrees, I mean 84 degrees, and that is the cora, and this is the magnitude. So that is the magnitude and correction. <clears throat> Any doubt on that? Uh, no questions as of now. Sir. Okay. Now I'll just show you some cases, like few cases. We can stop at any moment as you like. Yes. <clears throat> patient was referred to me for HTU. That was the X-ray. You can see femur is deformed. TB is also deformed with the limb length disparity. That is how we plan femur correction and a year day cortisoplasty also. And tumor correction and plating, tibial lengthening, and before and after. This girl, bilateral virus, you can see the mechanical axis. And that is the resolution core on the femur. I did only one osteotomy because I don't want to do more osteotomy in the femur, which is completely hidden in the soft tissue. Here I did two level osteotomies. So that is how the frame has been designed and fixed onto the patient's leg. And two level, I mean three level osteotomies, after correction, before and after, with good range of knee movement, she was able to squat even. That image is not there. This one I have shown earlier. He did a, did a tibial correction, and that is the three year follow up. So this is a very interesting case. You can see the lateral side. This is an unstable type of deformity. You can see an unstable, a non only on the lateral condyle and a deformity on the medial epiphyseal deformity. I blocked this epiphysis and this is a stress view, you can see it is opening out. Stress view it is closing together, valgus it is opening up. So this is unstable. So now I have to elevate this lateral condyle up and fill in with the bone graft and do the metaphysic correction by another osteotomy. And this is how it has been corrected. Plant. So on a frame, it has been corrected like this. I used this fibula from there to fill up the gap. And the graft has been held there by the olivides. And that is the joint line. And that is the final correction. So another genu valgum. The real, uh, how he was compensated. This is the real deformity. You can see the mechanical axis lying far away. Both femur and tibial valgus. After stage 1 correction. After stage 2 correction. Before and after. This is a common problem like distal femur. I personally like a plating. You can see I have done an error here. My error was, I did this, I correct, corrected it. And I used a long plate because the other plate fell down during surgery. And here you can see my distal screw is parallel here to the knee joint, joint line. So it was not parallel. So I had to make a reverse osteotomy, a deformity there. I kept the plate a little bit away. And still I got a mild translation, a golf club deformity like thing, but still got the correction well. That's how it was looking like. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. That was an excellent uh, academic piece, actually. Uh, as usual, thank you so much, sir, for accepting the invitation and taking this webinar today. And it was an excellent talk, sir. So, uh, now this webinar will be telecasted through Ortho TV, and uh, the, the fellows would have questions, we'll translate, I mean, transfer it to you. And if you have time, you can answer them. But uh, it was very nicely explained. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any questions there? So, um, no, sir. No questions as of now. Nothing. Sir. So, everyone, everyone, it seems very well explained. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Maureen. Uh, okay, nice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so talk here in the pediatric side generally, 
I don't go to pediatric meetings. Yeah. With other these things, usually, uh, I mean, I have not given priority for pediatric side. Yeah, in pediatric. Oh, I have a lot of work on pediatrics. Yeah. So I go. I taught Goda a few things which we can do uh, without frames, but uh, we'll still there are lots and lots of deformities where we have to lengthen, we have to correct in multiplane, and there's a huge uh, and the limb deficiencies. Yeah. Like uh, hemimelias, PFFDs, so where there's a huge role of illusoro. So I. Uh, I appeal to all the fellows that they, they must attend this Palakkar course one. I, I was also a trainee there before a few years, I think. I came with uh, Cherry. Yeah. Uh, I traveled from Kochi and that was a great experience I had. So I suggest all the young fellows that uh, who are keen on learning deformity, they must attend this course with, uh, and that will teach you a lot of things. Maureen, this time we had a very tough time. We had about more than 85 delegates. Oh, we tried to restrict around 50, but it was impossible. Yeah, but that, that your course is so good that more and more people want to learn. Yeah. So many a time it would be like you might have to conduct two courses in a year. Of course, that's too much of a burden on us in busy clinical practice. But uh, as you know, that in the, the basic PG curriculum, this deformity correction is not uh, taught in a great yeah. way. And so, uh, they, they need to learn it. Anyways, that, that's a, I think this is the beginning and we'll keep uh, on taking your help. I, I know that you are extremely busy, but we'll uh, keep some deformity cases and then you can help us uh, in guiding us. So, I uh, thank you from, uh, from our side. Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah. Buddha, you can conclude today's session. Yes. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending today's session. And the next session we'll be having, uh, we'll have tricky case of the month uh, on uh, 19th of this month, 19th October. And after that, we'll have sagittal plane deformity correction followed by other topics which we'll put up in the group. Thank you.